Hello and welcome. The ongoing great work of Mayo Roscommon Hospice and its palliative care services is well documented. But today on the programme, we want to share a very personal story of a lady originally from Norfolk in the United Kingdom, but now living in Ballinagar, just outside Castlereagh in County Roscommon. Five and a half years ago, Gaynor French was diagnosed with breast cancer. But just over a year ago, she was told that she had stage four of metastatic breast cancer and that unless she reacted to chemotherapy, she'd be dead probably within six months. Thankfully, Gaynor is with us today to share her extraordinary story. Thanks for coming in, Gaynor. Thank you for asking me. Let's talk a little bit about you and your background. You were born in the United Kingdom. Uh, you are a teacher or a lecturer by profession. I was, yes. Yes, I was. I taught, um, I taught in prisons. I taught teenagers with personal social issues for the Princess Trust. And I lectured human health and infectious disease and environmental science in universities in the UK. All very rewarding work. Yeah, it was. It was. I was a, a very dedicated teacher. I loved my job. I loved the kids. And I tended to take on children that maybe others wouldn't want to deal with so much. Um, children with learning difficulties, children with social issues. And to see them get through a de demanding course and pick up their certificates at the end of the year, there's no other experience in life. You know, you've got them to where they should be. The world's now their oyster. How did you end up in the west of Ireland? We, uh, my husband's Irish, and we came for a holiday in County Clare, bought a house in County Roscommon, like you do. I was asked to start a programme similar to one I was teaching in the UK to stop teenagers ending up in prison. Uh, we moved over, and then six months later, the Celtic Tiger died, and unfortunately, um, the position disappeared. So you, you left England lock, stock and barrel, we brought did. your children with you. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your children. Uh, I've got three children. My daughter's now 29. She's back in the UK with my granddaughter, who's two. I have a 22-year-old son who had left to go to university in the UK. He came back last year for a gap year to spend time with me. And my youngest is 16, and he's about to start his leave asserts. So life was good. Take me back to five and a half years oh, ago. Oh, life was amazing. I hit the age 40 and I thought, wow, they're right. It's an amazing age. I don't have to be worrying about how I look, how I act. Uh, and coming from the 80s, being a teenager in the 80s, I do not, comp you know, not conforming really well. And um, I was working with uh, several women who had breast cancer and didn't think anything of it. I've lost family members to breast cancer. I've fostered a little girl whose mother died of breast cancer. So I was always aware of breast cancer, but I was always so aware that it's something that happens when you're older, something to look out for. And then when I was 41, I just felt a little itch on my chest. I went to scratch, found a lump. Um, was seen by Galway Universal Hospi Hospital Symptomatic Breast Unit within a week. They told me on that day, yes, you've got breast cancer. Come back in two weeks, we'll have it typed for you. We'll tell you where we go with it. And within two weeks, I was down for surgeries, had the chemotherapy, had the radiotherapy, was treated amazingly well, would not have been treated faster anywhere else in the world. The doctors were amazing. My surgeon was uh, Professor Kieran, my oncologist was Professor McEnkeen, and my radiographer was uh, Professor Sullivan. They were amazing. I uh, can't fault them. It looked like I had an 80% chance of being absolutely perfect. We then work hard to get to the five-year mark. If you make it to the five-year mark, it's, you know, champagne bottles. I was three months off my five-year mark. Made the, well, not the mistake as it turns out, but made, just happened to say in passing to, in, in one of my random clinics, I'm feeling a bit tired. And the next thing I know, the blood tests are being taken, being sent for a biopsy, and then I was told it's in my bones and in my liver. And my son was about to start his junior certs, so I asked my team if I could wait till after the junior certs to tell my family. And they said, it's not an option. You know, it's treatment now or not at all. It's not viable. So I had to go home and tell my son just before his junior certs that the cancer was back and that it couldn't be cured. Um, I then went in for liver biopsy because they needed to see what the, the spread was and they needed to type it to see if it had changed. Um, sat 
in the hospital waiting for my biopsy results, about to be told I got chemotherapy. Professor McEnkeen came in and said, you know, we're going to start your chemo today. So there wasn't even time to think about it. Then later on, one of his team came in, and I was coping with it quite well. One of his team came in and said, we're referring you to palliative care. And I burst into tears. <laughs> and was it prior to that that they actually gave this six-month ultimatum? Yeah. Oh, I knew that. I knew that. I knew this was terminal. Um, I knew I could trust my team because I've been there before with them. I knew they did everything they could. But it wasn't real until somebody said, we're referring you to palliative care. And I broke down. It was the worst part of all of it, bizarrely. Um, because I suppose even 10 years ago, when I last experienced losing someone, palliative care were who came in that last week. They were the ones with the mega doses of morphine and, and that made it so real. And actually, I couldn't have been further from the truth. I know now. I, the best decision I ever made, other than having life insurance, was to say to the guys, do you know what, I overreacted, I want palliative care involved. And the reason I wanted that was because I've got three children. Um, and my youngest is 16, he's already gone through this twice. And I thought, if that's how I'm going to react, I don't want them, when I'm getting very ill, to suddenly be faced with the word palliative. I wanted to normalise it. So I was very lucky, the head of Mayo Roscommon Palliative Care for my area came and visited me. Um, the social worker came and visited me. Each of the nurses came to visit me. So even though I'm under one nurse, if they're off or on holiday, I'll be seeing the other ones. And, and the whole point of that was to normalise it for my children so that it wasn't scary for them. But actually what happened was I discovered one of probably the best services Ireland has that deals with it. The only service Ireland has, the only service Roscommon and Mayo has to deal with palliative care and actually, it's not about dying at all. Um, it was a huge shock. And I've had the social worker out to help me. You know, I planned my funeral the day after my diagnosis. I had the social worker out to help me work out paperwork so there's nothing left for my family. Because remember, at this time, I've got six months. So I planned my funeral. I organised my will. Aileen, who's my social worker, came out to help me sort out my end-of-life plans. And a lot of people say that's very depressing. No, I'm a mother. I don't want my family to have to deal with this. So they brought all this out. The nurse, nurses came out, they explained different treatment pathways, and that was it. And it's like, where do we go from now? Because actually, I'm still quite well and healthy. I haven't touched painkillers. I haven't, you know, I'm trying this trial, I'm trying that, that, this drug, that drug. And they're like, well, what do you want to happen? I said, well, can you text me every couple of weeks? So every couple of weeks, I get a text from my nurse, Martina, how are you doing? And then every sort of two months or so, she says, I'm coming for a visit. And I kind of gather, I could be wrong, I kind of gather this is not optional because women tend to be brave and women tend to lie. So she pops around the house for five minutes. Are you all right? We have a bit of a laugh and then off she goes again. So they're constantly touching base. And what has happened, what I thought would be a kindness to my children has actually been a miracle for myself because I'm not dying of cancer. I'm living with a cancer diagnosis and the little tips they can give me for little side effects here and there and just having a shoulder to cry on sometimes, it has meant that actually in this last year I've probably lived more than I have the 45 years previous. I've done so many things um, you because, said, because I know I've got that helpline, I've got that support yeah. in place. You said something before we started recording that you know palliative care has taught you to live, not to die. Definitely. Definitely. Um, it has, I think because women tend to hide things, we don't want to upset our families, we want to be the brave one. Sometimes we can't do that. So by, by being able to let off steam maybe with Aileen or discuss family issues, because there's no instructions for this, and it's so much more complicated than having a baby <laughs> and so much more paperwork. Um, because, because they're on hand to give me perhaps tips on how to say things, how to broach things, and how to ask for help. I'm actually living, I'm not dealing with any side effects. And it could be something as simple as gargling with bicarbonate of soda after a chemo treatment. Because something that simple, even though you hear it in the hospital, by the time you come out of the hospital, your head's in a completely different space. Um, it means you keep your taste, taste buds. You can still enjoy your food. You're not having endless mouth infections. Something as simple as, as bicarb. Um, little tips. 
Um, and all the way I was going through this, I never linked them with the hospice shops. And now I'd go in the hospice shops quite often because your size changes throughout treatment, you're up and down like a yo-yo. So I'd go and donate clothes, and then four weeks later I'd go and buy clothes, and I'd come back and think, well, they're the ones I donated. <laughs> or I'd go and buy books, I read them and I give them back, but I didn't click that all this paperwork I had when I was put under palliative care is actually the hospice shop. So the hospice shops that everyone's kind enough to donate to or go in and buy from, they are funding over 50% of our palliative care. And it, it's just amazing. Slightly disgusting in that it has to have that need, but totally amazing that the service of care I get is second to none. I cannot criticise it. Even when they say things I don't like to hear in, um, it's usually for my good. <laughs> Where are you in your head now? Because to try and comprehend all of this and to process it mm. must be extremely difficult. And, you know, I'm sure there are days when you put on a very public persona, maybe like you're doing now. But there has to be other days when, you know, the, the challenge of doing this would be something yeah. you wouldn't even contemplate. Well, it's important to note that the hospice isn't just there for cancer families. Uh, I think only a third of the people under palliative care at the moment have cancer. Anybody with a terminal disease can be cared for by the hospice. Where am I? Um, I get so angry at people that tell me to be positive and that attitude is everything because people do not pass away because they're not happy. But we kind of have this image that we have to be brave and women will be anyway. Women will not let their children see that they're sad or upset. And that's not harmful. So when you're talking to your nurse or you're talking to your social worker, I often find I burst into tears because they are giving me permission to say, do you know what, this sucks. I'm 46, um, I'm going through a rough time, my family's going through a rougher time, and it's okay to think, yeah, do you know what, this sucks. And today I'm gonna to go hide under my duvet, I'm gonna have a pajama day, I'm gonna get really angry, go out in the garden and shout at the universe who, by the way, doesn't want me up there just yet because I'm still angry. Um, and they give me permission and say, actually, it's all right to have bad days. It's all right to have days where you want to just hide under the duvet. It's all right to be angry. It's all right to be upset. And other days, it's all right to pull this big girl, those big girl pants back up and go and get arrested because that was on the only thing on the bucket list or go and climb Crunk Patrick two days after your chemo or <laughs> stupid decisions that I tend to make on the, on the spur of uh, the moment. But making sure that every minute that I'm not feeling unhappy is actually filled with joy. And as I go along this, um, humans are very good at adapting and we adapt and I'm adapting. I'm in a very good place at the moment. Do you confide in your palliative care team in a different way that you would confide with other people? Do you know, I was, I was saying this to the hospice guys. I've been a teacher and I've worked with vulnerable teenagers and there is a very narrow line between being a friend and a confessional, because I'd have children disclosing to me all sorts, and, and being professional. They've nailed it. I can tell my nurse, my, I say social worker, she's kind of a social worker counsellor. She helps with the paperwork, but she's also there with dealing with the emotional side. I can tell them anything but I still view them as my palliative care team. I don't see them as my best friend. So they've kept that professionalism and it must be a very, very tricky walk. It's not one I think I could do as well as them. It, th they have nailed it. I can trust them with everything, but I also trust them to be professional with my care um, and to build that kind of relationship with someone, as some, especially someone who can be as bitter and cynical as I can be. Um, yeah, full credit to them. They, they are, I just can't praise them enough. They are wonderful. Are you fearful of what the future holds? I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of how I die. So I have to trust them to help me die in a way that ensures I will always have dignity. But I think what is most important for me is that it doesn't scar my family. I don't want my children looking back in 10 years day, 10 years time, sorry, and say, it was terrible what mummy went through. It was terrible. I want them to say, she was an absolute pain in the neck when she was alive, but when she went, it's how she would have wanted to have gone. And I, the only fear other than that is, I don't want to leave my family. Who does? The critical message today, Gaynor, mm. is that palliative care are not two bad words. No, they're not, absolutely not. You should 
consider them the shiny star on top of the best oncology care there is in the world, which is what Galway offers. Um, I've seen my consultant go way beyond the level of duty. The oncology clinics are so long because there's so many people in them, but you never feel rushed. So that's where you get your factual stuff. Then you come home and then you've got the palliative care nurses. If I have an issue with, from the practical stuff to issue of appointment dates, things the doctor said that, because you're giving so much information, they can come out and translate. They'll come and give you a hug. They'll come and say, sure, what are you on now? Oh, I'm going to go and climb a mountain or, or, you, you know, and they're about management. They're about management symptoms so that you can, to a certain extent, push all that to the back of your mind and get on with living. So you manage things as soon as you have a problem, because there's no medals here for bravery. You're not a martyr because you lost your sense of taste when all you needed to do was rinse with a bit of bicarb. It's symptom management so that you can get the most out of your life and you can juggle things like the fatigue so that they don't get in the way of living. They are there, they're your team to help you control that side of your life so you can get on with living. Unfortunately, money makes the world go round. Oh, doesn't it? And like every other mm. charity organisation, mm. Mayora, Scotland Hospice, particularly the palliative care services, need that money so that they can go into places and hearts like yours mm. and, and make the reality bearable. Yeah. You've decided you're doing your little bit to raise money. I am. It started as a little bit. It grew. <laughs> um, I've, all my work in, in design has always raised money. Um, when, I, when I pass over, my, all my business now is handed over to my two-year-old granddaughter. Um, and a percentage of any sales on that goes to breast cancer research. Uh, I have another chart at the moment that's raising money for Macmillan. I have friends all over the world that are doing mad things like shaving their hair in my name to raise money for their charities. I'm tired now. I'm tired and I can't run marathons anymore. I can't. I don't want to deal with money because you get a condition called chemo brain. I can forget where I'm stood. <laughs> so I was in the shop one day and I saw a little hand knitted cardigan and I just said to the lady in the shop, do handmade baby items sell? She said, yeah, we can't keep them fast enough. They're gone. The minute they're in, they're gone. So because I'm, I'm in a crafting business and I've got a huge online presence, I decided I'd just crochet a few things for the baby shop. Then I put it on Facebook and then other people said, sure, we'll do some. We'll do some. Um, so we now have a Facebook group, Help the Hospice Charity Baby Event. And I've had all the last four weeks, I've had bags arriving from England, from America, from Canada, from France. People are, are taking the effort to crochet, knit, and sew hand knit baby things to yep. be donated to the hospice for them to sell. And I know there are a lot of craft groups in Roscommon and Mayo, and I know there are a lot of crafters, because I've helped people with the crochet, I've helped them with the knitting, now they help me. Um, if every one of those crafters just donated one item to a hospice shop with a little tag saying who's made it and where they're from, these items will then be handed into the hospice shop to do what they will. Um, I think we're looking at maybe a mother and baby event, maybe even a baby fashion show. It'll all go off how many things we get donated. Um, but for every one item donated, it's made with love. It's made from the heart. These have been made by people that care about me. Everybody knows somebody who's been under the care of the hospice team and the palliative care team in Ireland. Um, wouldn't it be amazing if just one person donated one thing to sell in the shops and to raise awareness? Because while we're looking at end of life, it's important to realise that life, or, there's always new life. And this is looking at the more positive side. There's always new life. My new life is my granddaughter. So what started off as making something for her has now moved over to, come on, let's make some money for the hospice charity. So if you're into knitting or crochet, what we're asking you to do is to make a baby garment. It can be any type of a baby garment. The ones we have here are predominantly cardigans and little hats, but uh, other things can be crocheted and knitted. Or quilted. Or quilted. <laughs> and as long as they're handmade and individual, you can drop them into any of the many hospice shops around the region. We'll be giving you the website and the contact details at the end of this interview. Just finally, a few quick questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, how are the family now in terms of rallying around or accepting what has been thrown upon you? They're in a better place now because of the palliative care team and Roscommon because they provide family therapists. So I've got two sons and sons don't talk. 
So for them to have an outlook, a face that they get to know, somewhere they can go and talk to and they know it's confidential, because I, I'm mummy, I don't need to know. Uh, they're trying to protect me, but they have to look after themselves. So I would say as a family now, we are doing okay. There will be wobbles, there'll always be wobbles, but as those wobbles come up, I know that Aileen, who's my, my family therapist and social worker and counsellor and, and miracle worker, um, is always on hand. All I have to do is send a text. And it's that easy. Uh, same with the nurses. If I have an issue or a problem, I just send them a text uh, and they're there. What about spiritually? Has, has that helped in any way, shape or form? <laughs> um, they are very respectful of every individual's spirituality and where they are, not, are on that path. So for me, I would say I have issues spiritually at the moment. Um, but that's okay. And understandable. And I'm told that's okay. And if I want to go out and stand in the back garden and shout and swan, swear and rant, that's fine. Um, for other people, you know, you know, I've got my end of life plan. So they'll ask, is there a certain priest? Who would you like to come in or not, as the case may be? And for me, I, I think the fact that they are so respectful for your individual views, I don't think they care. Their priority is me. And whether I believe in the man in the moon, Scientology, Catholicism, or, or a disc world on the back of turtles, for those of you that are Terry Pratchett fans, they're not bothered. As long as I'm happy with where I am, that's their priority. And there is no pressure or a lack of pressure. There's understanding and there's compassion, um, irrespective of a person's spiritual views or where they are. And the fact that they, they're okay with me sometimes being angry, sometimes being upset, sometimes saying maybe there's something, um, I'm allowed to do that. There is no pressure on their part. And, and that's important, because I know a lot of people feel, well, sure, the do-gooders. They're really not, and they're not invasive. If I wanted to see them every week, they'd be there. If I ask for a text once a month, they're more than happy with that. As long as I know, they're happy that I know, I can contact them at any time. They, they work with me 100%. Last question. Yeah. What's the roadmap now? Is it literally one day at a time or are there a few boxes you still want to tick? <laughs> I do not look ahead. I look from 12 week scan to 12 week scan because every scan can say, you know, we're sorry. So I work on a 12 week scan. In the last year, I have tried to prove to my children that even when bad things happen, good can come from it. So the fundraising is good that's come from it. I've gone on a motorbike, never doing that again, mind you. I had a day on the trams with the Lewis because some friends in Dublin, I love the trams. I just, I'm a child. I think because I was born in Norfolk, but all my family was all over the UK and the train meant a holiday. I love trains, so I've, I, I've done that. I've climbed a mountain. I have, I watched a new series on called Book It and the, the comedic um, character in that wanted to do, do a streak in a sporting event. So it shows her running out and she comes back, I'm really glad I've streaked in a sporting event. And her daughter says, Mum, it's Crofts. Or all I can say is GAA teams, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Here I come. I take it a day at a time. I, I don't, my only book bucket list was to have a book published for my granddaughter. Did that, first edition sold out, second one was out, that sold out, that's done, cherry on cake. The only other thing on my bucket list was to get arrested. Um, I've been arrested. Um, the, my husband got together with the Castlery guard and they came round, night, round one night to arrest me for smuggling wool. So that was the setup, and I told them, before I even knew what they were there for, I told them off for walking on my grass. I don't respect authority. If a challenge comes up, I will do it, because I want to prove to my children that life is full of challenges, and you've got two ways of dealing with it. You give up and go and hide, or you take it by the teeth and you go for it. Although I'm not going up in an aeroplane and skydiving, not for anybody. Okay, no, thank you so much for telling you. your story and we wish you the very, very best. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much for having me on here. That was Gaynor French. And if you'd like to more, know more about the services of Mayo Roscommon Hospice, you can log on to their website, which is hospice.ie or call them on 094 93 Thank you for watching.